Woman Ministries, and today I wanted to just read through Matthew 5 with you. I've really uh, been meditating on Matthew 5. I started reading the Beatitudes a few days ago in preparation for the video I did a couple days ago regarding meekness, because it says, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And so I got a lot of uh, great knowledge and wisdom out of it during that time, and I wanted to just go ahead and read through it with you guys and just kind of see what kind of spiritual insight and wisdom we can gain. Matthew 5 says, Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And I talked a little bit about this in my video a couple days ago. Being poor in spirit is something that we have to understand that we are and that we need the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so when we approach God, we are to approach him poured spirit and in mourning and, and deep repentance over sin. And it says, blessed are those who mourn, um, which is something, you know, I talked about as well, that it's the, the present tense. It's not blessed are those who have mourned. It's blessed are those who mourn. And uh, I think that if you are a true Christian and you are uh, completely honest, uh, with yourself and see yourself uh, through the lens of God, uh, then there is reason to be in mourning uh, because we fall uh, terribly short uh, of any kind of righteousness that would ever earn our way into heaven. And blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. So um, I like this because it's telling us that poor in spirit, mourning, and meekness will inherit the earth. It says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Are you merciful towards people, or do you go in for the attack? If you're not merciful, then I think that you're at odds with God, uh, and maybe you can't even be blessed. Do you hunger and thir thirst for righteousness? Do you yearn to see that in the world? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Is your heart pure, or do you have ulterior motives? Do you scheme and plan and connive? Do you do that? If so, uh, I would say that uh, you're not pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Do you like to make peace with people, or do you like to continually be in opposition with people, even uh, if those people have asked you for forgiveness? Uh, and you choose to hold a grudge and, and not be uh, peaceful with them, then you can't be blessed because it says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they are the children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So this is uh, comforting in some ways. I know that, especially as a Christian, doing a ministry online over social media like YouTube, you do get insulted quite a bit and you do get persecuted and you do have uh, false things said against you. And I believe a lot of that is a spiritual thing. I believe that uh, when the enemy sees somebody with the Holy Spirit, uh, a, tr a, a Christian, uh, ministering uh, and spreading the truth of the gospel, that the enemy hates it. And uh, the enemy operates through other people. And, you know, the Bible does say we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Uh, and so one of the things that you do when you have spiritual discernment and spiritual wisdom is that you learn to separate the flesh of the person away from the spirit that's operating behind them. And, and you certainly should uh, pray uh, for those people that do that to you. And it's going to talk more about that uh, at the end of Matthew 5. It says, Salt and light, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. Why? Why are we the light of the world? We are the light of the world because the uh, Holy Spirit reflects Jesus through us. 
says a town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and give its light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So, again, I believe this particular verse is uh, insinuating that when we have the Holy Spirit, when we have Jesus, you know, uh, don't hide that. You know, go out to the world, minister, preach the gospel uh, in whatever way, you know, God sends you to. It's going to be different for everybody. But I think that if you have the love of Christ in your heart, that it's something that comes naturally uh, through you. And uh, I struggled for a while personally with uh, figuring out how I was going to uh, reflect the Lord in the world. Um, and I believe that I was uh, kind of drawn to doing the YouTube channel because it was a way for me to uh, evangelize and uh, shine the light of the Lord. And so um, it's been really a blessing. It has not been easy, but uh, I, I do it because I love Jesus. And then it says, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. And this doesn't, by any stretch of the imagination, condone a works-based salvation. But when you have the Holy Spirit, when you're reflecting Jesus through the Holy Spirit that's living in you, that you naturally do good deeds. And good deeds can be evangelizing, spreading the gospel, uh, supporting your brothers and sisters, uh, loving one another. I mean, there's a whole different array of potential things that you could do on a day-to-day -day basis that can be considered good deeds that glorify you to others. But the motivation has to be uh, the right motivation. If you're doing the good deeds in order to work your way into favor with God, that's never going to work. But if you come to God, like it says in the Beatitudes, and poor in spirit and in mourning and in meekness, then that is when the Holy Spirit can reside in you and you can do good deeds that actually do glorify the Father in heaven. And then Jesus goes on to say, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. And I find it interesting that right after he talks about, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven, that the next uh, verse he is talking about fulfilling the law. So he goes from saying your good deeds and then he's talking about the law. And I think that that was um, intentional because I, I, it's tied together. And let's hear what Jesus has to say. He says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of the pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. And so a lot of people have different opinions on this. First of all, when he's talking about who sets aside one of the least of these commands, what commands is he talking about? Is he talking about the commands of the law? Or is he talking about uh, what he has just said previously about being blessed? showing mercy, being pure in heart, being peacemakers, uh, you know, being persecuted, how you respond to that. You respond with rejoicing, uh, going through and evangelizing, spreading the news, being the lamp on a stand, shining your light. Uh, you know, these are the things that Jesus was just talking about before. However, I also have read this numerous times, and my feeling is... Uh, when he says, for I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, then you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. And see, that's the stumbling block right there. Because the Pharisees were not righteous. The teachers of the law were not righteous. They, they believed they were righteous through the law. But Jesus saw them completely differently. He could see right to the heart of the matter. And he's going to go into this a little bit more with murder and adultery. But he could see in their hearts and he knew that while they appeared to be righteous and holy on the outside, that they weren't righteous and holy on the inside. And that's what God looks for. Jesus clearly showed us that there isn't a way to work your way into heaven. Your righteousness does not come from the law. We are so sinful and we're in such a state that we can't even 
The Old Testament people couldn't even live under the law. The law was there to show the depravity of men for when Jesus came. It was a mirror that Jesus held up and said, look, this is the mirror of the law. And on one side of the mirror, you look like a holy man. But if you look at your reflection, you look like a demon because your heart is wrong. Anyway, it says, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder. And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable in court. And anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. So Jesus is saying, if you simply are angry and you hold an anger within your heart against a brother and sister, then you're as guilty as murdering them, the physical act of murdering. And here is where, you know, Jesus is uh, counterbalancing the spiritual side with the physical side. You hate your brother in your heart. It's the same as murdering your brother. It says, therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar, go first and be reconciled to them and then come and offer your gift. So Jesus is commanding us to uh, be reconciliatory with one another. And, you know, that's not always possible, but uh, that is a command from Jesus. Um, leave your gift on the altar and be reconciled uh, to the best of your ability. It says, settle, matter, settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And again, Jesus is saying you may not be physically committing uh, adultery with another woman, but if you even look at her with lust in your heart, then it's the same thing as if you actually had sex with her. You know, again, it's it's juxtaposing the spiritual condition of the heart versus, you know, the law. You know, it it, it can't be fulfilled either way. We're, we're even spiritually deficit. And that's why we need Jesus so dearly and so badly, because we cannot fulfill the law physically and we can't fulfill it spiritually. We can't. Anyway, it says it has been said, excuse me. It says, if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. For it is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go to hell. And, you know, this is not saying that we ought to go out around poking out our eyes and chopping off our hands. But rather, it is, uh, again, demonstrating the severity of the, of the sin. It's demonstrating the severity of the sin. It, it's so bad that it would be better for you to poke out your eye or cut off your hand than to continue in your sin. But thank God we have Jesus. Divorce. It has been said anyone who divorces his wife must give, her, must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, makes her a victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. And, you know, this has been widely debated. This could be a whole topic in and of itself. Uh, I believe, personally, that people can get remarried. But, you know... In the eyes of God, he sees it as committing adultery because you uh, should be cleaved to your first, you know, your husband, your original wife, your original husband, and then anybody else that you have, you know, sexual relationships with after that, it's considered adultery in the eyes of God. However, it's in the same category as looking at a woman with lust or hating a brother. You know, it's not something that's damnable, but it's a condition that we're in. But we do have Jesus who forgives and restores and... Uh, you know, so we have to be thankful for that. And all of these things, to me personally, really reinforce our deep, deep need for Jesus. It says, again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, 
for you cannot make even one hair black or white. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond that comes from the evil one. You have heard that it was said, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them too. Give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. This last paragraph is re directly related to this previous one regarding I for an I. He says, excuse me. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of the Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? If you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not, do not even pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And we're perfect by uh, loving our neighbors and and, and uh, loving our enemies. And loving your enemies is a very difficult thing to do. Uh, you know, it doesn't feel good to be persecuted. It does not feel good to, um, you know, have people come against you. And I think that that's a challenge for many people, including myself. And the way that I see about it is my heart isn't willing. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I mean, if I'm going to be completely honest, my heart does not want to pray for my enemies. But if you do it, anyway, despite of that, God will uh, nurture that uh, forgiveness in you. And uh, it, it's really, again, you know, he's talking... Previously, he was talking about you're the light of the world and you're reflecting God. You reflect God when you uh, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Isn't that what Jesus did? Uh, if you give a uh, gift to the one who asks you and do not turn away, you're reflecting God. I think in the circumstance we're talking about, you know, praying for and loving your enemies, you know, uh, you just really have to just say something like, you know, dear Lord, you know, uh, you know I'm being persecuted by this person here, and uh, God, you know how I feel about that. You can see my innermost thoughts and my feelings and my heart, uh, and I, I'm struggling with, um, you know, being forgiving and, and for loving these people who are doing evil to me, God, and, and uh, you know, I, I want to pray for them uh, because they wouldn't be treating me like this if they were truly a child of God. They wouldn't be treating me like this if their heart was right with you, Lord. And so, God, I just ask that you make their heart right with you, Lord, um, and forgive them and to help them see you clearly. I mean, and when you say that to God, what you're doing is you're reflecting Jesus. And it says more to God about your character than anything else. Because if you can humble yourself enough to pray for somebody who has hurt you, then it pleases the Lord greatly. And we need only look to the cross of Calvary to hear Jesus' words when he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. To understand what Jesus is talking about here. Amen? So God bless you. I hope this was edifying. I am still working on a video regarding uh, meekness and women and biblical submission. I'm taking a little bit more time on that. Uh, there, it's a lot of information, uh, and I'm trying to best decide what to include and what not to include, and uh, I think I'm overcomplicating it because I really, um, you know, earnestly want to present uh, the, the biblical truth on the matter. Um, and so um, I'm, I'm kind of working through that right now, but please uh, keep an eye out for that if you're interested. Um, and I have been talking to a, a good friend of mine, uh, and we are going to be uh, working on a live stream uh, for ladies uh, where we're going to be talking about, uh, you know, biblical stuff that are of interest to women and how they relate to their husbands and how they relate to their children and how they relate to each other. Um, so I'm really excited about that. Uh, this person, she and I have had uh, really fantastic conversations. And I, I always tell her when we talk, I wish we had this recorded because this could be so edifying for somebody. You know, when you just have those really great Holy Spirit-led conversations about the Lord, 
So I really hope to bring some of that to you. Uh, and uh, it will be mostly directed towards women. Of course, men are, can join and listen if they like. Please keep an eye out for that. And, uh, you know, I just want to thank each and every one of you um, for being kind and supportive and caring. Um, and uh, I really appreciate you all. I love you very much. And uh, may God bless you each uh, abundantly. God bless you. And as always, if you've enjoyed this content, check out more Bible studies in the Bible studies playlist. And be sure to like and subscribe.